Okay, some of you may have noticed that this is a video is on a new playlist called Hack the Mac. And um, even before I got my Tor Mac, um, I was looking at ways of uh, improving it and bringing some more performance to it. Um, and today is going to be just an intro to a very, a fairly simple, straightforward hack. Um, I'm not sure how many parts this uh, this video will be in, um, but we'll see uh, see where we go. But basically, what I want to do is um, is start with the the concept of a simple load meter and develop it more into a spindle monitor um, using some digital electronics to uh, communicate directly with the VFD. Um, but uh, I don't want to exclude other people who have got uh, no interest whatsoever in digital electronics. Um, I'll take care of them at the end of this video and show them how to build a very simple analog load meter for their Tormac. Um, and it's not, I don't have an issue with Tormac. Um, I, I love my uh, PCNC 1100. It's a phenomenal machine. If you look at how much it costs and what it enables you to do, it is one of the best value things I have ever bought in my life. I, I really, really like it. Um, but the flip side of that is, um, obviously, Tormark are in, uh, in business to make money. They need to make a margin on it. So if they can keep the uh, build costs as low as possible and produce a machine that um, has very basic functionality, then they can keep, then they can make their margin, and the 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 sale price is going to remain low as well, and that's the best thing really because it enables as many people as possible to be able to afford one and um, and uh, end up uh, following through with their ideas, building, making, hacking. Um, so I pro I wouldn't have it any other way, um, but. Uh, you know, there's no reason why some of us in the community uh, can't uh, uh, do our own hacks and, and start improving functionality ourselves. Um, you know, John Saunders over at uh, NYCNC, uh, he, he did a great one uh, and got the Tormac to text message him when it needed a tool change. He's mentioned he's, he's going to be designing some intelligent coolant system for it, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, you know, Brad over at Tactical Keychains, he's done a, a, a quite a few little uh, videos and, and mods to his uh, Tormac. Um, but yeah, this is this is my five cents really, uh, and we'll start with something simple. Okay. Okay, you don't need to purchase one of these, um, but I, I highly recommend it. Um, it's called a Emerson Smart Stick. Um, you know, part numbers there, um, and what it's used for is it's basic flash memory, and you can back up the parameter set on your VFD. Uh, to this uh, to this flash memory, take this out of the VFD and stick it on the shelf. That way, it doesn't matter how much monkeying around you do with the VFD. If you mess up settings or parameters um, when you're hacking it, um, you can set it back to exactly um, how the VFD came from Tormac. Um, the instructions aren't brilliant. This is about the sum total of what you get in English. Um, but uh, don't worry, I'll be covering how to how to uh, do a parameter backup um, using this uh, a little bit later on the video. Okay. Okay, so whether you decide that uh, you just want to build a basic load meter uh, for your Tormac or whether you want to start uh, having a go at doing some um, serial communications directly with the VFD, um, it doesn't really matter. You're going to need to gain access to the VFD itself. Um, now, um, I showed the smart stick earlier. Um, if you're confident with your um, programming skills and your uh, in whatever uh, microcontroller environment you're, you're, you're going to try this in, then you probably don't need to buy a smart stick and, and do a parameter backup. Um, however, if you're not quite so confident um, for the cost of the smart stick, I'd say it's probably worthwhile. And, and even doing that, you cannot uh, by default access um, the VFD and perform a parameter backup before you start messing with it. So this first segment, we'll just have a look how to uh, access the VFD and then how to do a parameter backup, okay? Right, um, you'll need three documents. Um, the first is the instruction manual that comes with the Emerson Smart Stick. Um, the second one is this document that I've already mentioned. It's called the Advanced User Guide for Commander SK. Um, and then the third one is uh, application note uh, number 279 from Emerson, which is uh, entitled uh, Commander SK Security. And again, I'll put links in the description to both these, um, both these files. Um, but let's have a look how to access the VFD. All right, during this process, you're going to need to power cycle the VFD, and that's controlled by a solenoid in the control cabinet. So the easiest way I've found to do this is to set the speed control to minimum, put it into manual mode, and then when you want to turn power onto the VFD, 
hit the start button. Uh, the spindle will start up because the default setting will be uh, to read this uh, potentiometer and, and set that speed. You can hit the red reset button on the VFD directly to stop the spindle. Uh, and then to cut power again to the VFD, just use the spindle lockout key to turn it back to zero. Okay? Okay, the first thing we should do is figure out what uh, access level we have for parameter set in the VFD. I don't know what the default setting is. Um, when I first had mine on, I messed with it. I found that I only had the access, the level access one, uh, which is the basic 10, uh, first 10 parameters that uh, you can see written on the front of the um, VFD. But uh, I'll show you uh, what I mean and, and how to change that, okay? So first thing we do is we power the um, VFD on, uh, as I say, by hitting the start button. The spindle will actually start up. We'll just hit the red button. And that'll stop the spindle. Okay, so um, it's basically a ready, ready state now. If we hit the uh, M button once, uh, we get into uh, sort of lists of parameters to view them and then just scroll down and if if 10 is the maximum that you can get to before it jumps back to 1 again um, then you know that you're only at the first level axis. So go to parameter 10 and you'll see L1 written here press the M button again, change that to L2 and then hit M button again um, and now we can go further than number 10. Okay, scroll all the way up till we get to uh, parameter 25, which is the security code parameter. It'll probably say zero next to it, but this doesn't mean that the code is zero, it means that it's just not displaying it, and hit the M button again. If you've got the word code display, you know you've got security code enabled, so we're going to need to do something about that next, okay? So we'll power, power the system down using the um, spindle lockout switch. It takes a moment to, for the power to or the solenoid to kick back out again. But if you just leave it, it'll power off. Okay. So the next time we do this, we're going to have to re re power cycle the system. Um, but this time, hold down the up and down buttons. Again, hit the stop reset button to stop the spindle. Back into the uh, menu structure. And scroll back again to parameter 25. And we've now got security code displayed here of 129. I'm not sure if that's the same on all Tormax, but um, you can either remember that and use that and input that as a change code every time you change another parameter. Um, but for me, that's just an annoyance. So I'm I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna change that to zero. And when you set it back to zero, it means it removes the security code from the system. Hit M to set it. Hold down the M button. And we're back to ready state again, okay? All right, now we're gonna do a parameter backup on the VFD. Um, take the smart stick, and the little metal contact should be placed to the left. And put that in the slot on the front and power the drive back on. You can stop the spindle again, red button. Okay, go into um, uh, parameter, the menu structure by pressing M and uh, scroll up till you get to parameter 28. Um, and this is uh, the backup parameter. At the moment it's reading no. If you hit M again, get to change this now. And there are four options. No, read. Uh, this basically reads the contents of the stick and programs it to the memory on the VFD. You don't want that. Uh, the second one is uh, program mode. That will take the parameters that are on the VFD and write it to the stick. 
And then the third one is a boot mode. And uh, I'll mention something about that in a moment. But uh, set it to program mode and then just hit the M button. Uh, your VFD should then drop back to saying the word no. If you look carefully, you saw my one actually came up with the word fail. Uh, and this is because I've already gone in and set boot mode on my smart stick. So I'm not able to overwrite the parameters on there. I've basically got the set of uh, defaults that Tormac issued. I wrote it to the stick and then I write to protect it so um, I can never change that. Uh, that way I, I know that it doesn't matter what I do, I'm never going to accidentally lose the parameters to get back to the starting point. Um, if when you do this, this, this process um, and it goes through and it comes up with no and you don't see anything else, you know it's succeeded, it's fine. Uh, the, other, the other thing that might be displayed is a trip code. I believe it's um, t.cdat, and that's basically saying that the VFD uh, was not powered up or wasn't uh, reset with the uh, smart key in it. So just reset the smart key, power the VFD down, and uh, reboot it, and uh, it should go through. But as I say, if you go in um, to parameter 28, menu button, uh, sorry, go in 28, menu button, scroll to program and hit the M button again, it will write, uh, and you see nothing else, and it flips back to no, you know it's written correctly to the uh, smart stick. Okay? Right, this segment is for people who um, have absolutely no interest in uh, digital electronics, and all they want is an analog meter on the front of their tool Mac to give them some sort of a rough approximation of, of what kind of load they're pulling on their spindle. Um, it's really easy. All you're going to need is uh, some wire and a voltmeter, preferably a zero to five volt voltmeter. Um, these can be had on uh, on Fleet Bay for about uh, uh, three bucks uh, if you don't mind three week wait from China. Um, I didn't have one. I wasn't going to buy a uh, zero to five volt one uh, just for this. I got a zero to ten volt, and all I did was I changed the load resistor in the back of it, half its value, and now it's a zero to five volt voltmeter. Right, most difficult part of this build is um, connecting the wires to the back of it. Um, just uh, take a note of which is the positive and which is the negative terminal back of the voltmeter, okay? Uh, now what I'm about to say is going to be fairly blunt, and um, but there's no uh, diplomatic way of putting it. But uh, any information that we try and get from an analog gauge like this is uh, basically useless for uh, any kind of practical use or analysis of perhaps uh, tool paths or monitoring tool life where um, have a think about it um, if we're using a quarter inch or three eighths inch uh, end mill um, it's going to be hovering somewhere up between the 20 and 40 percent uh, sort of area and if all things being equal and we're running a cycle of you know the same cycle and 20, 20 uh, times later down the line um, we've increased tool tool wear and therefore we put an additional 5% of load on the spindle. Well, I, the, the difference or change in location of that needle is going to be virtually imperceptible. Um, and actually you'll probably get a, a bigger difference just through parallax error uh, by looking at the uh, gauge off, off, uh, off center. Um, if you want to try and use it for optimizing tool paths, the, 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 the same same situation is true really. It's virtually imperceptible any, any changes. Uh, the other thing is you're going to have to um, control your eyeballs like a comedian. You're going to have to keep one on the workpiece and, and one on the gauge to see how uh, load changes through the, throughout the tool path. Um, alternatively, uh, maybe you can use two video cameras and videotape the, the cut and videotape the movement of the needle on the gauge and, and try and play in the back simultaneously. I don't know. Um, yeah, um, have a think about it and, and you'll probably come to a similar conclusion. Um, so with that in mind, um, having a nice graduated scale on here is, is fairly pointless. Uh, so we might as well um, print out a, a nice colored bar, a graduated scale and get that stuck on there. Uh, remove two screws, uh, the front comes off the gauge and we can just, as I say, print out um, uh, something on a shipping label, cut it out and stick it on there, okay? Right, the next uh, next thing I guess is to get this installed. So we're going to have to wire this up and, um, and set uh, one of the parameters to uh, output the correct reference voltage, okay? Before we get on to this final step, um, 
we'll have a, another look at this document and try and explain uh, what we're actually going to do. Um, again, it's this advanced user guide. You, this document is key to everything uh, to do with this hack. Um, but if you read pages um, uh, 106 through 108, um, it'll tell you what's going on. Um, and particularly, we're after this sort of extended parameter of 7.33. Um, you can see here, there's some mathematical formulas of how it uses some of the parameters uh, that it's calculated internally, uh, does some math with, with them, and outputs a reference voltage on the analog um, output pin from the VFD. There's uh, four choices. There's um, frequency, load, current, and power. Uh, in general, this reference voltage is a 10 volt signal, um, but uh, if we use the load option, uh, it'll only ever achieve 5 volts maximum. You, you can look through the mathematics and, and read those three pages and you'll understand why. Um, there's not a lot of difference, to be honest, between load and uh, the LD and A option or, or load and current option. One's active, one's reactive current. Um, but uh, uh, I, I'm choosing to use the, uh, the, the load function. Um, so how do we access, you know, advanced parameter 7.33? Well, uh, page 30 of the manual tells us as well that um, parameter 7.33 is also the same as uh, parameter 36 from the front panel of the um, of the VFD. So all we need to do is go down to parameter 36 on the front panel and choose between frequency, load, current, and power um, to get to, to select which which uh, reference voltage we want to output. Okay. Right, this last step, we're going to program up parameter 36 and then get this uh, load meter wired into the VFD, okay? Same procedure as before, stop the spindle, hit M. Screw up to parameter 36. Mine's actually already on load, but yeah, you just hit the M button and scroll up and down between the different options. Um, M again, and then hold them in. That's the ready state, that's it. Okay, uh, final thing, we'll undo the screw, take the front cover off, and I'll show you what, how to wire this thing in. Okay. So after you've taken the front panel off the VFD, most of the information you need will be, um, is actually molded into the plastic up here. We've got two rows of terminals, uh, this they refer to as the top row and uh, give T numbers. And uh, this very first one here, T1, uh, is the uh, zero volt reference. So that's, we connect the black wire to that, that's our ground. And then uh, the in the bottom row, there's the very first one here is B1, and this is the output pin for analog reference signal output. So positive wire goes to that one. And that is it, okay? Okay, the final thing I'll say is, um, you know, to be honest, analog gauge like this isn't completely pointless. It does have uses. Um, it, it'll indicate when there's a serious problem with the spindle. Um, the other thing it might be able to do is uh, is give you some sort of indication uh, for low speed, high pressure operations such as tapping. If you've got many, many holes to tap, in either, either in a single or multiple work pieces, then the first time round when the tap's nice and sharp and new, you might be able to sort of take a note or put a sharpie mark on the gauge uh, to indicate the, the load required to tap a hole. And then by the time you get round to your hundredth hole, have a look on there and, and see how the load has changed. Um, yeah, the, the, it has limited uses, um, but the bottom line is it's, it's uh, less than five bucks uh, worth of uh, China, China's finest and about five minutes to build the thing. Uh, you can't expect much more. Um, but uh, what is of far more interest is this little black thing down here. This is a RJ45 port. It's not network. Um, it's uh, RS485, so it's a serial port. And it's running a protocol suite called uh, Modbus RTU. So we can actually send serial uh, requests direct to the VFD and ask directly for parameter sets. And this is where the hack's gonna, gonna go, okay? Okay, this, this final part of today's video is just going to be an overview of where we're heading um, and uh, if it gives uh, uh, some of you out there some, some ideas and you guys want to go ahead and start hacking something together yourself, that would be fantastic to uh, uh, get some other uh, input on this. Um, 
But basically, we need to choose a, a microprocessor platform to start developing with. Uh, I personally, I like Pix myself, but um, uh, there's far more support and there's sort of Modbus libraries written for um, Arduino, so I'll probably end up using that. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to use at the moment. Um, probably, if I can, I'll use maybe a Pro Mini down here, or I've got um, another small uh, 328p chip here on a board um, and just minimal components, um, or whatever flavor diddly the winner you want to use, really. Um, we may find that we need uh, more and more input pins and might have to escalate to something like a mega, but, but we'll see what, what happens uh, over the development period. Um, Anyway, whichever one we choose, we, by default it doesn't talk um, RS-485. We're going to need something to change signaling and change voltage levels. And that's handled by a chip called a, a MAX-485 chip. And you can buy these modules on eBay for 2 or $3. And, and this way we can just plug this straight into the BFD and this gives a, a, a 232 a signaling that we can use with our Arduino or, or microcontroller and, and, and uh, make the uh, level changes there. Um, as for a display um, on this board here, I've already got a little OLED display set up with some you know, frequency load and stuff uh, running on there, um, real basic stuff. Uh, but maybe um, maybe we should use a, a, a two-line LCD display or um, a larger OLED. Or um, if we can figure out uh, a good way of getting meaningful data out, uh, we could push the boat out and use a, create our own graphic user interface with a touchscreen here um, with some multiple tabs, multiple pages, and we can see uh, all sorts of other information on there as well. I, I don't know how it's going to uh, uh, develop at the, at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, really I'd like some feedback from you guys, um, some ideas, what kind of functionality you'd like to see in, in, in this. Um, um, post those in the comments, but just sort of off the top of my head, uh, you know, we could display you know, voltage, frequency, RPM, active current, reactive current, power, uh, either in kilowatts, horsepower, or hamster power. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the code will take care of everything after we've got the communication working with the VFD. Um, there's other things that we could do is we could uh, maybe. Uh, drill some shallow holes into the spindle nose and uh, use some thermal epoxy to fit a uh, thermistor and a vibration sensor in there and do the same with the motor as well. That way we can have some sort of uh, health monitoring system and give us early warning of, of, uh, of uh, thermal issues with either the main spindle, the motor, and even take thermal information directly from the VFD. Um, the other thing uh, which, which might be worth looking at is um, John Saunders mentioned it the other day on one of his videos, and that is uh, one of the best indicators that the cut is going wrong or overloading the spindle is the sound the spindle makes. And it's just human nature. When you hear that a sound that you're not expecting, the first reaction is to turn and look at, the, look at where the action's happening, not look up at the control panel. So maybe we can take um, the, the, this light ring, Brad's idea of this light ring, and start modifying this, and maybe put some tricolor LEDs in here and, and change the, the, the hue of the, um, the spindle light uh, as load uh, sort of reaches 60-70%, we can start sort of mixing in some uh, orange or red lights. Um, maybe when the VFD enters full back condition, we can get the whole thing to pulsate red. I, I don't know. Whatever ideas you've got would be, would, would be great. Um, the final thing to have a think about is, is how can we actually uh, make a, a good practical use of this system? Um, you know, because we're interested to, to possibly get the system to indicate when tools need to be replaced uh, or in fact try and uh, uh, um, optimize tool paths. It, it's actually a very difficult uh, thing to do um, because you need to keep all parameters the same except how sharp the, the cutter is. So that means the depth of cut and the width of cut has to be the same, the material cutting has to be the same. The the feed rate has to be the same, the RPM has to be the same. So if you're cutting uh, one-off items, two-off items, a system like this, is there's not really any, any decent way to do it. Um, but if you've got a certain number of um, cycles that you run again and again and again, well, because it's a digital system and we can, we can take uh, records and perhaps write them to an SD card, well, this begins to open up some possibilities. Uh, 
um, maybe we can use our microcontroller to communicate with Mark III and say like, what's the file name or the cycle name and what tool number we're we using. Um, it can then uh, poll the load, load information every 50 milliseconds or something and begin to write that data to a card. At the end, it can then calculate an average load or a peak load or do some sort of um, statistical analysis, uh, standard deviation or something on it and, and keep, a, keep record of that. So every time we run the same cycle and um, it'll look up on the SD card, right, what's the cycle name, what information I've got for all the, all the different num number tooling uh, on that cycle, how's it changing? Um, you know, that's a possibility. But um, maybe we don't have to go that far. Maybe we can just have a, another mode within our, um, within our uh, user interface that basically has a record button. We know we're doing a certain operation, as I say, as I mentioned earlier, tapping might be a good one. And we can just hit the record button and it will then, uh, it will wait until the spindle starts or the spindle hits a minimum 5% load and then, you know, uh, take, uh, take uh, readings every, every few milliseconds and, and, and generate a graph or a data set for that tapping cycle. And again, when the, um, when the spindle stops moving, it'll, it'll automatically uh, stop collecting data and store it and again the whole thing will start again and again and again and it can just give us a, a, a sort of current read of how that average load is changing i'm not quite sure so um yeah there's some things to think about so if anyone out there has got some good ideas um how we can make a a a good spindle monitoring system what functionality they like to see in it we'll uh, i'll take it from there okay and uh, as i say i'm more than happy if anyone else wants to contribute or, or or add some other stuff to this, I'd be more than welcome to uh, uh, include that stuff and, um, and obviously uh, uh, give credit where credit's due. Okay?